So hello everyone, my name is Dominic and I work an, as an astrophysicist at TU Dortmund University and I have the great honor and pleasure of being the outreach coordinator of the MAGIC collaboration and today together with my fantastic colleagues Marina and Jelena who are backstage in this live stream, we all together with our guests from the MAGIC collaboration will try to bring some light into the dark. So for the Dark Matter Day we want to talk with you about the mysteries the scary stuff maybe, but the interesting stuff also, the dark matter in the universe. Now, let us start um, with magic. I mean, magic, okay, you know, the dark arts, yeah? The veil between reality and the magical realm, it may become thin at some time of the year. Halloween is around our doorstep now. Um, but for us, magic stands actually for major atmospheric gamma ray imaging Cherenkov telescopes. So it's an acronym that already tells you what our collaboration set out to do. We are observing the universe at very high energies with photons a billion times more energetic, sometimes a trillion times more energetic than visible light from the beautiful island of La Palma from the Rocco de los Muchachos Observatory. And that's what those telescopes do. So we can they enable us to study the universe at very high energies without the need of going to space, without the need uh, to use a satellite, um, but to do it from the ground. Now, maybe if we take a short look at those telescopes, I mean, these are really large um, uh, scientific uh, instruments. They are operated by an international collaboration that in total uh, is, uh, is, is uh, comprised of about 300 persons. So that's not only scientists, of course, of all ages and career steps, but that's also our fantastical technical and administrative stuff um, without whom we never could operate those telescopes. Now, maybe we can take a short look at uh, those telescopes just to uh, show you um, what, what it's all about. So how, how these telescopes are actually operating. Now in the background, you can see images of the two magic telescopes. You see the beautiful landscape of the Rocco de los Muchachos Observatory in the background. And then you see those two telescopes, Magic 1 and Magic 2. They operate as twins, so to speak. You see the large main mirrors. They reflect the starlight even in this beautiful photograph. Those mirrors, they have 17 meters of diameter. So that's a really, really huge instrument. You see they are supported by a lightweight carbon structure and important because those telescopes, they can slew very fast. Actually, in a few minutes, they can reach any point on the sky that is given. That's important because sometimes we follow up on, on rapid uh, things like gamma ray bursts. And you see high up in the air here on, on those masts, you see our cameras, which are very, very fast cameras, uh, the photomultiplier cameras that can see those elusive flashes of Cherenkov light that get produced when higher energy gamma rays enter the Earth's atmosphere. So, and that's how we do science at this beautiful um, island of La Palma. And today, of course, we want to talk about the darkest side of the universe, which is the dark matter. And for that, we have as guests in our studio here, Francesco Gabriele Saturni, who is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, National Institute of Astrophysics, the ENAF, in Rome and of the Space Science Data Center of the Italian Space Agency, ASI. Welcome, Francesco. Hi, uh, Dominic. Yes, hi. And as the second guest, we have Ivana Batkovic, who is a, a PhD researcher at the University of Padua and also at the National Institute of Nuclear Physics, INFN, uh, also in, in Padova. Hello, Ivana. Nice to have you here. Hi, Dominic. Nice to be here. Hey. So, and also joining us is, is Moritz Hütten, um, who is a project researcher at the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research, ICRR, at the University of Tokyo in Japan. And Moritz is our convener of the Astroparticle and Fundamental Physics Working Group in uh, MAGIC. So uh, that's also a great amount of expertise. We welcome here in the studio. Hello, Moritz. Nice to have you here. Hi, Dominic. Good evening from Tokyo. I see also in your back there is actually already Halloween taking place, uh, so <laughs> and the landing. Yeah, it's already dark nice. here, so I started already to celebrate. 
oh yeah, it's already dark where you are. That's right. So you see, that's really a global thing, the magic collaboration. The sun, it never sets uh, on earth. Yeah. Somewhere it's always daylight, but somewhere there's always night. And that's like for an astronomer, that's it's really fascinating to work in such a huge team and, and with so diverse group of people. So now after having all of you here, so assemble this great amount of expertise about this fascinating topic, uh, do you think we can venture a bit into the dark? Do you think we are ready to bring some light into darkness and, and study this most elusive mm -hmm. of form of matter that physics knows about today? I think we are. So let's maybe just jump right into it um, with a few questions about the dark matter maybe starting uh, with a question for francesco i mean how do we even know that dark matter exists we talk about it very often but but what is the solid evidence that it's even there at all well first of all uh, let's say that we recently know that dark matter exists but uh, the fundamental uh, thing is that uh, we only know that uh, from uh, indirect proofs of uh, his existence. That is, we never caught until now a dark matter particle or uh, a dark matter component at all. We never saw it by naked eye. We only know that it exists uh, because we can uh, measure some uh, of uh, its effects uh, on the normal matter in the universe. And my normal matter, I mean uh, the matter of which we are composed. Uh, protons, uh, neutrons. Uh, so the, the, the ordinary matter that uh, we all know. And these effects, moreover, are only related to the gravity. So we know that dark matter exists because it produces gravitational alterations on the... Uh, gravity that, it, that it is, is expected from the, the, the normal matter only. And we know this uh, essentially from the, 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 the first years of last century, when uh, in 1930, astronomers started to uh, introduce uh, additional matter to describe the, pro the gravitational problems that they were encountering, for example, when dealing uh, with uh, the motion of galaxies inside clusters, and then when dealing with stars in galaxies. And at all these scales, uh, they felt that there was uh, the need to introduce uh, a new component of matter in the universe, uh, which was something uh, unknown at the time and was uh, unobserved, moreover. So they named it dark matter. Up to now, today, we have uh, additional evidences, indirect evidences, that dark matter must exist. Uh, and uh, we have uh, these evidences, uh, for example, from uh, cosmological measurements of the uh, uh, famous cosmic microwave background or from the analysis of the distribution of galaxies on, the lar on large scale structures in the universe. And uh, combining all these measurements together, uh, we know today that dark matter uh, encompasses more or less a quarter of the total energy content. So let's say uh, a quarter of uh, the total universe uh, content, whatever it is, uh, is made by matter and the largest fraction of this matter is still dark. We don't know yet anything about it. Wow. So uh, one quarter of the total of the universe is made up of dark matter roundabout. And of course, the majority of all matter in the universe is actually dark. So that's fascinating stuff. But I mean, that makes us wonder, of course, what is so mysterious about this? You would you would maybe expect that we would for long have seen very, very direct evidence. So Ivana, maybe you can enlighten us a bit. What is so mysterious about dark matter, actually? Uh, well, as Francesca Gabriella said, uh, we know that there is uh, dark matter because we feel its gravitation. That basically means that there must be something very, very heavy. 
but the thing is that we absolutely don't see anything. It is completely invisible, like a perfect glass or, or James, James Bond's invisible car. Uh, so far, researchers have considered many candidates that uh, could, could make up the dark matter, uh, such as small black holes, uh, orphan planets, gas, or even neutrinos. Um, so far, at, at this point, they could even show that none of them uh, are, are sufficient to explain the dark matter. So today we believe uh, the dark matter must have a new form uh, of some exotic elementary particles, which are different from anything that we know so far and that our universe uh, is made of. Wow, James Bond's invisible car. I'd like to have one of those actually, made up of matter that no one has ever touched and no one has ever seen. I mean, that's really one of the most profound mysteries of our times and girls and boys out there, I mean, if that's no in incentive to become a physicist, I don't know. So we need a lot of help uh, in those searches, but of course we need also good guidance. We need to look, we need to know where to look. Maybe Moritz, you can talk to us a bit about um, where do we actually search for dark matter? So, uh, yes, sure. And uh, as we think that the universe is full of dark matter, so we see dark matter at all scales in the universe. So, uh, if you now look uh, at some pictures, um, so I prepared here some uh, nice pictures of how the dark matter is uh, distributed throughout the universe. So maybe, ah, yes, here we see it. So this is actually uh, how the full universe would look like on scales like a billion of my light years in diameter. And uh, all what we see here is how we think the dark matter is distributed throughout the universe. It's like a spider web of dark matter. Uh, throughout the universe. And if you look at these uh, nodes or knots uh, or like uh, uh, synapses of this uh, yeah, brain web of dark matter, how it looks like, then we see here where these uh, nets meet, that's where the galaxy clusters of our universe are located. And also they shine very bright in dark matter or very heavy dark matter clumps. So uh, you see the coma cluster, Perseus cluster, Virgo cluster, and also the so-called great attractor. But uh, where are we actually here? And we are actually located in some of these voids very close to uh, the Virgo cluster, but um, yeah, somewhere which we doesn't, what we doesn't see here on this picture. But here actually we find our Milky Way and also close by the Andromeda galaxy. And also these galaxies are located in big clumps of dark matter. And uh, if you look closer at the Milky Way or this dark matter clump of the Milky Way, so we are actually located inside, but only, oh, sorry. But only at the very, very center, you see here a picture of the spiral galaxy of our Milky Way and also the Earth. So we are surrounded by a huge halo of dark matter and also these little clumps close by. So you see, we have a lot of dark matter structure in the universe on all scales. Wow, so we have really a portfolio to choose from, right? Uh, so we can search for dark matter at the largest scales. We can peek into the dark hearts of galaxy clusters, but we can also, of course, try to go more close by, like in our local quiet outskirts of the cosmic web, uh, look for our local structure and search for dark matter there. And now, of course, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good plan to do that. And to really make this plan a reality, uh, we, of course, need our powerful instruments. We need our magic telescopes. And now talking about very nice vicinities, like for sure our galaxy is one, but also ma magic is in a nice vicinity at the Roca de los Muchachos Observatory on the Canary Island of La Palma. And now we will, uh, together with you, make a virtual trip there and uh, will bring to us into our studio from La Palma, from the magic site, Daniel Cashback, who is Daniel a postdoctoral researcher at Hello, Dominic. Uh, and a colleague uh, of Ron Moritz in convening the astroparticle and fundamental physics. And physics. And there is a bit of an echo here, but uh, I mean, it's a long distance call. Hello, Daniel. Nice to see you here. And nice to see beautiful blue sky of La Palma in the background. Hello, Dominic. Welcome to La Palma. Yes, as you can see, it's not really dark here. Very, very sunny today. It's very sunny. It's yeah, very we'll, sunny. We'll, we'll chat about that in a, in a second. And then, of course, joining us also from La Palma is Alice Donini, who is also a postdoctoral researcher at LAPP in France. 
So welcome Alice here in the virtual studio. Wow, and I see you already in full protection gear. Very nice with the telescope in the background. Fantastic to have you here. So guys and, and, and friends, how is the volcano do doing today? Ah, I think Daniel, we can't. Daniel, we can't. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I see now the host unmuted my microphone. <laughs> not a problem. No, no, so no, the, no, today, no, actually, the volcano is not visible from from the site. Uh, it would be more or less behind me, where you can see the sand, and as you can see, there is no ash uh, rising up. So today, it's uh, let's say quieter than 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 yesterday, for instance, but still active, nonetheless. Yeah, that's but that's, that's good to hear. That's I mean, good it's, to uh, hear. I mean, it's, uh, it's a spectacular, it's a spectacular phenomenon, uh, this volcano, but uh, of course, it's also uh, at, at, at times it's, it's a problem for the local population and we sure hope that there will be relief soon. But it's good to see that today at least uh, the sky is clear and, and uh, it may be a good sign. So very nice uh, and, and very glad to have you here. And now I think... Um, it's time, maybe Alice and Daniel, if you would like to take us on a short tour around the site and show a bit the telescopes, right? Yes, okay, so let's go. So as you can see behind me, there is this building, which we call the counting house. This is the, the building from which we operate the telescope. And if you follow me inside, I will show you the actual room from which we operate uh, the telescope. Okay, here it is. I will turn slowly the phone so you can enjoy it. And you can see here the main screens. Obviously now it's uh, daylight, so no, no many softwares are open, but uh, at night there will be many softwares here to control the many parts of the telescope, like the camera, the mirrors, or the drive will control the movement of the telescope. And okay, that would be the room where we operate. And of course we are close from the telescopes, so we always have an eye on it, although at night, the, the, the windows are always closed because we don't want the light from, from our control room to pollu pollute the, the sky that we want to observe. But from this window, we can see, here yeah, you can see magic wand from close. And if we move slowly to the other window, you have a nice view on the magic two telescope. And at the top of the tower here, you can see in the yellow suit, you can see Alice, which is now going to show you the telescope from much, much closer. Spectacular. Spectacular, yes, we saw, yes, her, we saw um, her already. <laughs> and there you are, Alice. There you Hello. Are, Alice. Ah, Alice, I think you are still muted. Maybe you can try to unmute uh, your phone. Don't worry, happens. Actually, at the moment in the background, you can see that this is actually a beautiful day today at La Palma. You can see this fantastic blue sky. There's a bit of clouds, sure. But you can see how, how actually clean and clear the air can be in the midst of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, now the picture in a way, now it's, it's back. Um, and so that's one big argument to build our telescopes at such fantastic sites because we need the best of weather conditions um, to make those most powerful of gamma ray instruments operate to the best of their capabilities. And also, of course, we have many days like that on La Palma, um, many more days compared to like Central Europe where the sky is clear. Now you have a spectacular look already to the main mirror of the magic telescopes. You can see that's like, I mean, it's, it's like the largest selfie mirror on the entire of, entirety of Earth, right? You see us standing here next to the camera reflected in this 17 meters mirror. So in the, in the yellow jacket um, and with the helmet, you see Alice. And now moving uh, to the camera. So that's one of the cameras of the magic telescopes. You see that this is really a large instrument. You see all the connected cables um, and for, for cooling and for data readout there. And this camera, it can be parked on this access tower uh, just because we need, of course, to have an, an access for maintenance of the camera. And of course, we park the telescope during daylight 
pointed exactly to the northern direction. Maybe you can guess why we do that, because look at the beautiful vicinity around the telescopes. There's a lot of plants around them. And now those telescopes, they don't have protective domes like many other telescopes have, and they don't need to actually. But if they would not be parked north, um, the sun could actually strike the mirror during daylight, and that would actually be a fire risk. So we park them exactly north um, so that the sun and daylight never enters the mirror of the telescopes. There again, you see beautifully the mirror of this telescope. You see the reflected landscape in the background, and you can very well imagine how much light those mirrors can connect. So that's really also an engineering marvel that Alice is showing us here. And it's obviously it's great fun, and it's uh, it's one of the pleasures of our life to be able to operate those telescopes. Yeah, and you can I think imagine <clears throat> that with those fantastic instruments we can make really huge progress um, in searching for the dark matter in the universe. Maybe Alice, you can also briefly move over again to the uh, twin telescope, like with the with the camera pointing over. Yeah, and there you see in the in the distance you see uh, like the uh, magic wand telescope. Uh, which is, as I said, operating in twin mode, stereo mode with the telescope we are at. In the white container you see in the foreground also, there is electronics and electrics uh, that we, of course, need uh, for operating those telescopes. And now, yeah, that's one of the, of the most fantastic observational sites on the northern hemisphere of the Earth. There is the counting house where we are inside, of course, and you see in the distance even you are looking down on the Atlantic Ocean. So that's a fantastic place to be, the Roque de los Muchachos here. And we are really happy that conditions today, they are actually quiet and good. So we are not so much worried about the volcano, to be honest. Um, it's a natural phenomenon. And it's, of course, uh, like it's 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 a problem for people directly affected. And we very, very much feel with our friends on La Palma that get directly affected by the lava. Um, for the telescopes, I think we have found a way of protecting them during the next week when there's still some ash fall maybe from, from the volcano. But we very much feel with the island population. I mean, we have been operating those telescopes for now uh, many years on La Palma, and we have become close friends with many there. And that's maybe also something we can say. The, the, uh, the authorities on La Palma, they have made open possibilities for donations. So if anyone watching here thinks they, they want to do something for the La Palma Island population, we can very much recommend to think about a donation to the local authorities for relief. There's the counting house in the background. And yeah, maybe we can uh, then switch back uh, to uh, Daniel one more time, who is whom I'm seeing here with the telescopes in the background. The background. I'm Ian Dominic. Yes, you are here. Yes, so you, are here. You, you, can, you can tell us can a bit what is the plan for what today? What can Alice and you be doing? Actually, Alice and me are not working on magic today. We are working on the Big Brother uh, LSD, which is close by. So today in magic, I think the site, uh, the, there won't happen much. Uh, but I think tomorrow night there will be some LIDAR measurements to, to test the transparency of the atmosphere to see the effect of the ashes of the volcano, actually. That, that's it for now. As you said, the telescopes are parked and protected, let's say, against the ash fall. So no much, not much can happen these days. Yeah, and that's good. Yeah, and it's and good to good have you there as experts, expert, of course, to, of for the course, safekeeping of our telescopes. Our... And as you have said, I mean, story is always going on. Already now we are constructing the next generation of Cherenkov telescopes on La Palma with the LST telescope um, for the Cherenkov telescope array. And of course, we are with you in thought. And thank you a lot for having us uh, uh, a virtual tour around the site there. And all the best um, to La Palma. Thanks, Alice and uh, Francesco. Daniel. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So now back sort of in uh, the uh, studio. And now after having seen how powerful instruments we, we can employ in the search for dark matter, maybe let's like talk about um, a, a bit more about the specifics of the search. So, and of also the properties of dark matter, because if we know how something comes into existence, we also may know how to search for it. Francesco, um, can you 
talk to us a bit about how dark matter is produced in the universe and maybe like is there a pathway over which dark matter can become visible for us yes so first of all uh, let me just introduce uh, with a fundamental uh, concept in this kind of science we know that that dark matter exists and for this we know that somehow it must be produced at some point during the life of the universe the point is that uh, until now we only know that it's produced somehow we don't know how we don't know basically anything we can only make some guesses and hypotheses about uh, how this kind of matter is produced at the very start of the universe life and then we know that uh, it must evolve uh, somehow with uh, during the history of the universe but we have no knowledge about the precise details uh, yet uh, on how this dark matter is produced still uh, we need to at least uh, make some guesses some hypotheses on uh, how uh, as you were mentioning before that matter can become visible in the actual in the modern universe because uh, we must uh, at some point uh, come to know some somewhat about the dark matter side the dark matter physics and so the since uh, we said before that uh, we assume that uh, dark matter is made uh, of particles we know that fundamental particles in the normal matter interact so it's natural for us to extend this concept of interaction also to the dark matter world now the main two categories uh, of particles that we can think about uh, as dark matter components uh, sit uh, at the two extremes uh, of uh, uh, let's say types of matter that uh, we can think about we can think about in fact uh, about very massive particles of dark matter which are called uh, usually weakly interactive massive particles or WIMPs for a more fancy and mysterious name it's, it's just the acronym, don't worry on the other side we can also think about very very light particles with almost no mass at all just to give you an idea when we talk about massive particles we are thinking about particles that are at least 100,000 times more massive than a proton for example so you can imagine one of these wimps uh, as being uh, uh, heavy as uh, much uh, as uh, 100,000 protons altogether and for these particles in particular uh, we can think about the fact that at some point during their life they can interact one with each other in a process called uh, dark matter annihilation and it's basically a process for which two particles of the same kind interact one with each other and then through some process about which we don't know anything yet hopefully they produce other particles in particular okay here we go in particular they produce ordinary matter what we call the matter that belongs to the so-called standard model of uh, of particles and these standard model particles can subsequently interact with each other and produce what we aim to observe in the end which are these uh, gamma ray photons uh, which we are searching for with telescopes like MAGIC another process of course uh, is uh, the hypothesis that uh, these particles uh, being very heavy can uh, decay through other processes that we don't know yet and they can decay again into standard model uh, particles that they can in the end uh, that can in the end produce uh, these gamma ray photons uh, as well uh, that we aim to detect uh, as you can see from the screen uh, 
there are formulas to we use formulas to describe uh, to describe these interactions uh, and in these formulas the most important important quantities uh, are uh, the uh, quantities uh, quantities that feature uh, some integrals uh, some integral operators uh, inside them inside that definition and they are particularly important to us because uh, the larger is the value that comes out from that integral the more probable uh, is the detection of those photons because that integral uh, gives you the amount of photons that we expect uh, from uh, a sky region so for example uh, before uh, we were uh, mentioning about a portfolio of uh, dark matter objects that we must point with our telescope and to go on with the analogy of the James Bond car, actually, in order to uh, detect uh, in, in, in easier ways some signal from uh, dark matter interactions, we, we must point actually at the dark matter tracks, at, most, at least, at the dark matter uh, commercial ships to, to, to ease the detection of this, uh, of this signal. Wow. Okay, so dark matter becomes photons, basically maybe via the same process during which dark matter came into existence in the Big Bang. That's a fascinating circle somehow. Moritz, now this begs the question, how would dark matter actually look like in gamma ray light? So, so yes, sure. And as uh, Francesco has explained, so we see the gamma rays. We hope to see these gamma rays produced from dark matter annihilation or decay which produces a very faint glow in the sky. And uh, then uh, Francesco also showed the integral we have to evaluate. And actually, if we do this uh, exercise, then we really can compute the sky, how it would look like in this faint glow from dark matter annihilation. And uh, yeah, so this we did uh, to, to, to estimate what we expect to see in the sky with our telescope. And uh, yeah, that's how it looks like. So. Um, yeah, so also we see the sky full of uh, yeah, dark matter stars or these uh, different clumps in the universe of dark matter, which uh, we expect to shine very, very faint uh, in, in gamma rays. So we have uh, these very far away galaxy clusters, but also yeah, closer and smaller by, closer by and smaller clumps, which also might shine very bright. And this is where we finally point our telescopes to, to detect this glow. So maybe we can also see another visualization uh, where we see the full, uh, yeah, full globe, uh, this, the full sky of dark matter, and this time from dark matter decay. And you see, uh, yeah, if we would see um, uh, this dark matter annihilations in gamma rays, so the sky, the gamma ray sky would really look spectacular. And uh, so uh, this is what we are trying with our telescopes. Unfortunately, so far we haven't detected anything but we are working every day hard to maybe soon achieve this. Yes, and imagine one day being able to make such a map uh, like like really of the dark matter distribution in the universe for measurements, right? I mean, this would for sure be one of the most spectacular breakthroughs ever in the history of astronomy. And all of us, I think, can be very happy to be able to work on such a fascinating topic. And so we, of course, we cross our fingers every day that soon there will be a real detection of dark matter annihilation or decay with our telescopes. Now, I mean, one thing we should maybe also think about is really down to the, to the particle nature of the dark matter. We often talk about weakly interacting, but very massive particles um, that may constitute the dark matter in the universe. But Ivana, um, you are a leading expert on axion-like particles. Um, maybe you can tell us to the contrast a bit about those type of particles and how do they relate to the dark matter mystery? Uh, thank you, Dominic, for the leading uh, expert uh, adjective. I wouldn't uh, find myself uh, in that position, uh, hopefully one day. But yes, I'm working in magic with uh, axion-like particles which are theoretical particles that are connected to the spontaneous breaking of global symmetries. So a lot of theory involved. Um, they are more general um, relatives of a famous axion whose uh, story started back in the 1970s when it was uh, proposed uh, to solve a, uh, solve a problem of the standard model of particle physics. 
Uh, moreover, it is axiom, it is proposed uh, to conserve one of the symmetries that is uh, otherwise expected to be broken. So, also as uh, axion, alps are also theorized as bosons, which means they have uh, zero spin and they have very, very small mass. Uh, expected amount of axions uh, would be enough uh, to make a great part, a great fraction of dark matter that we expect to have in the universe. Uh, another reason that makes uh, them suitable for candidates for dark matter is that they would be dark. Uh, which means that they would hardly interact uh, with ordinary matter. But what we know from theory of axions is that we expect them to interact with photons and fermions, such as electrons. And this is the key tool that we use in our um, searches for, for axion-like particles. Um, as of the dark axions, uh, also another important property is that they would be cold. And that's why they could make up a cold dark matter. But it means uh, that they would be produced in the early universe. And as such, they could give us an insight into processes that occurred then, uh, also possibly including the, the process of the inflation. Uh, in our case, we are using uh, magic telescopes and the very high energy gamma ray data that we collect with it and investigate ALPS interactions with photons. Uh, these alps that we investigate are having a bigger mass than those that could be uh, uh, accounted for dark matter, but could anyhow give us an insight of the processes and the physics behind. So what we expect is the photon interaction with axions. So once we have our photon emitted from the astrophysical source that we uh, observe our spectra of, we expect those photons interact with axions, <laughs> like this, with alps and uh, create wiggles in our observed spectrum. So once the photon is emitted, it passes through strong magnetic fields on its way from the source to us and is being converted to axions. Since we cannot detect axions, this uh, conversion can uh, produce wiggles in our observed spectra. And this is exactly what we are looking for. We are looking for wiggles that could, using uh, our analysis and uh, the theories that we have available could associate uh, could be associated to the existence uh, existence of ALPS. Wow! So that's that's fascinating stuff, and it's also very befitting to Halloween. Like you have those those uh, <laughs> exactly those figures. My personal you, <laughs> very nice. So your personal photo action conver conversion, very very nice. So. Now that again begs the question, I mean, we have talked about searching for heavy dark matter particles by peeking into the dark hearts of galaxy clusters or in the mysterious dwarf galaxies in the halo of the Milky Way. But for your studies, you probably need different targets, right? Yes, yes. In our case, we are looking for uh, astrophysical sources. Um, so sources of very high energy gamma rays uh, that could be relatively close. And uh, what is important is to be embedded in strong magnetic fields, um, suitable enough and to, uh, to enable and encourage axion uh, photon mixing that we could, uh, we could detect. Uh, for example, these could be active galactic nuclei uh, located in cores of galaxy clusters, um, uh, possibly, hopefully, with already investigated magnetic field, since it has been shown that uh, modeling of these magnetic fields through which our photons, very high energy gamma rays are passing through, um, can cause, uh, can cause uh, uh, very big uncertainties later in our results. So this happens to be a crucial part of the analysis. Yes, so there's a lot of work to do. And maybe my colleagues, like, uh, what we can for sure say is, it might be a mystery that's too big to solve it this Halloween. It might be too big to solve it until the next Dark Matter Day even. It might even be too big for us alone to solve, right? So whoever is watching now and thinking about taking up studies of physics, astronomy, or related fields, please come join us on the dark side, right? Because we all need a lot of support from you out there. And we are very much welcoming uh, new Dark Matter hunters also in magic. Now maybe let's go a bit to uh, questions from the public. There was a question, um, 
on, on in general, why are galaxy clusters interesting for dark matter searches? So what's special about galaxy clusters? Maybe Moritz, that's a question for you, right? So yeah, sure. I mean, they are the very super heavy, massive uh, clumps of dark matter. Actually, they're the heaviest uh, bound objects in, in the full universe. So with the uh, yeah, 10 to the 15 solar masses. So this is like a, a thousand times uh, a million, not a million, wait. Yes, almost uh, uh, like a million times a million times a thousand uh, solar masses. So huge objects uh, of, of dark matter. And um, so in yeah, this huge amount of dark matter, um, uh, in case of heavy dark matter particles, uh, a lot of particles uh, annihilate or decay. So we can see them, although they are relatively far away, we could see them relatively bright with our telescopes. Yes, thank you, Moritz. So if we don't at the moment have additional questions, I mean, that's, that's absolutely okay. If there come up any question, feel free to contact us anytime. I mean, we are a very diverse community of interested researchers and we are very open to questions also from you. So contact us anytime or join us also next time when it is Meet the Magicians uh, here and on other channels. We will be happy to have you back, of course. For now, I'd like to again thank Ivana, Francesco, Moritz, and also Alice and Daniel, of course, on the Canary Island of La Palma. And in the backstage, my wonderful colleagues, uh, Marina and Jelena, who have cared about uh, this live stream very <laughs> deeply today. I hope you had some fun. Thanks everyone and have a very nice Halloween and Dark Matter Day weekend now. Ah, there is a question, very nice. Did the rise of machine learning and deep learning change the way you do your daily tasks? That's a very, very good and deep question. Uh, I don't know, maybe Francesco, you, we would want to provide an answer here. Regarding yeah, the sure, searches, and then sure, we can uh, go to Ivana regarding the regarding the the, the AGN. Okay, well, Sorry? for sure, it's uh, it's really uh, I mean the 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 possibility to use machine learning and or deep learning in our research is uh, really a game change. It's potentially really game changing. Uh, uh, possibility for us uh, just because uh, in this way we are uh, definitely able to uh, scale up uh, our possibility to uh, basically speaking work with numbers and uh, provide uh, provide, provide uh, uh, more and more precise answers to computational problems that uh, we must uh, uh, deal with uh, when uh, uh, when making research when performing research about that matter and uh, in this case at least also for example in the case of the general detection of gamma rays uh, with Cherenkov telescopes uh, there is uh, uh, there is nowadays a, a, a a large push on the machine learning and deep learning side in order to improve the algorithm the algorithms that we use to to detect classify and start and finally study these gamma rays so yeah the machine learning and deep learning field is really related to not only the dark matter field but to the gamma ray astronomy field in general and so the answer is uh, is potentially yes, and uh, this will be much more and more important in the future, of course. Yes, so it's also a transformative thing for us. Ivana, I don't know, you're, you're searching for these fine wiggles in the spectra, right? Maybe their machine learning methods could also be of help to extract this from the, from the large uncertainties in, in the unfolding of the spectra? Uh, well, hopefully. <laughs> One day, yes, so far we are using the, the methods that we have uh, uh, by, by doing the, the analysis, the statistical analysis and uh, what we are used to. But uh, hopefully uh, machine learning and the deep learning 
will enable us to to to, to distinguish these um, these oscillations, these wiggles in the spectra much better since we are currently limited with the various different uh, effects that we have on our spectra being observed and later with the constructing the the initial initial spectra of the source. Thank you. So as I said, come on board everyone and join us. And there is another question. Can we combine data from different telescopes? So can we think about, I think, using satellite telescopes and other ground-based terrain of telescopes in searching for dark matter? I think the answer uh, is an affirmative yes. Maybe, I don't know, Moritz, you want to answer? It's true. Maybe even Daniel is still there in the background. If not, I can also try to give an answer. Yeah, it, yeah, I, actually, I'm not sure if they are still in the stream yet. Otherwise, Daniel, of course, would also be. OK, so I, uh, I already tried to give an answer. In fact, we are already doing it. And uh, it's, it's quite a challenging, challenging task. But uh, it's also uh, yeah, very, very interesting to, um, yeah, to combine the data from, from different telescopes. So we not only have the magic telescopes and the Palmer who are observing the, the gamma ray sky, but the Chankov technique or in TV gamma rays, but also we have uh, the Veritas telescopes in Arizona and the HES telescopes in Namibia. And also we have satellite detectors orbiting the Earth uh, searching for gamma rays from dark matter. And so currently we are working with all these instruments and many more um, on a combination of the data to, to find the signal which would not show up in each of the individual telescopes. Yes, so it's already successfully, I would say, being done, right? So it's a very, very natural and good idea. There is a question about um, how do we deal with the massive amounts of data we get from the telescopes? Ivana, maybe you want to answer this from a very, very direct experience doing analysis. So how is this? I mean, what's the typical amount of the typical volume of data from one night of observation and how do we deal with that? Well, uh, to be honest, <laughs> the exact amount, I'm not really sure. But uh, how we deal is uh, that we have a very developed uh, software, uh, for example, in, in MAGIC that we call uh, MARS uh, as an abbreviation. Um, and MARS uh, basically de deals with uh, plenty, plenty of uh, things for us. What we do is uh, that we use the, the data, we use the, the programs that we have to uh, ultimately reproduce, reproduce the spectra and get the, the final uh, science results. Uh, but the, 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 the problem of dealing with the massive amount of data is almost uh, like there, there is almost none since we have a software very uh, well developed that deals with it very nicely and smoothly. Yes, so it's it's also a tiered process, right? I mean, typically uh, we we try to get rid um, of anything that that is that is clearly noise as soon as it is possible. In terms of data, I think it's like a like a rough guess. It's surely not completely correct under each and any circumstance, but a rough guess is like a terabyte of data per night, so, something like this in in this ballpark. So you take the hard drive of this laptop here, it's a, it's a it's a terabyte. So that's like in raw data per night. So that's a that's that's a huge amount, yes, but that's amount that uh, modern technology can actually tackle. And we have a lot of expertise on board. We have our, our colleagues from from PIC in Barcelona, so a very huge data center that does actually a lot of work for us, also long-term storage of the data. And of course, we have distributed around those 12 countries, 300 persons, a lot of local experts that also care about driving the analysis forward, producing Monte Carlo sim so simulations of the telescopes and the data taking uh, to best uh, optimize the analysis change. So that's really, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that we are fully up to at the moment, I think. It will be a challenge that increases with the next generation of telescopes. And so we have to increase uh, also our amount of expertise and, and persons that come on board. It's the same always, yeah. So, yes, if there is no additional questions, I'd like to thank everyone again. It was actually a very, very interesting 
uh, round of, uh, of, of experts we had here. And be with, with us soon again when we say meet the magicians and have a nice day. Thanks all. Have fun with the light and the dark side of the universe. Bye bye. Bye bye, Dominic. Bye bye. Bye, Dominic. Thanks.